Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon. This is Carol Razzo from Elderworks, and uh, we appreciate you coming in and uh, participating, <coughs> excuse me, participating in our town hall meeting uh, with an elder law attorney. We want to uh, say a special thank you to uh, Peck Ritchie and for joining us today. Uh, Lauren Machel, who is the executive assistant uh, to Kerry, uh, has helped us in setting everything up and thank you, Lauren. And we have Kerry Peck uh, with us, of course. He is a managing partner at Peck Ritchie. I'm sure you all know him well and author. Um, and as well as that, uh, trust, they're all trusted and wonderful partners with us here at Elderworks. So we appreciate your support very much. Uh, we will be recording this and uh, following this, we will put it on Facebook Live. We had a little bit of a technical problem on that to be doing that during the session. Um, I think we can ask questions during the session, as I understand, Carrie, is that agreeable with you? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, I'll be watching the chat box, so just put your questions in there. And uh, in the meantime, I would say, you know, can I unmute yourself at that point or I can unmute you. So, uh, Carrie, go right ahead. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, Lauren, were you going to give a little overview first or is Carrie going to take care of that? I'm sorry, I didn't ask before. No, that's okay. I have a PowerPoint ready to go. So Great. Perfect. we're ready to get rolling. Perfect. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Carrie Peck. Uh, I lead the law firm of Peck Ritchie and uh, we focus our practice on issues related to aging, disability, death, dying, and taxes. Spend a lot of time in the uh, courtrooms of uh, Cook County and the surrounding metropolitan area. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, financial uh, exploitation of older adults. Uh, I want to thank Elderworks and Carol, Carol for their um, help as always. We love to work with uh, Elderworks and Jennifer and Gail and Carol and others. So um, as Carol mentioned at the outset, uh, we'd like this to be a very interactive discussion. Um, in the world of Zoom, it's difficult to do interactive programming in large measure because everybody talks through a chat box. Um, I would suggest that if we can avoid that today and if you can uh, appear on the Zoom screen and uh, unmute yourself or as uh, Emily or Carol unmutes you. Uh, it would be nicer to, to see and talk directly with each other rather than through the chat. So uh, having said that, um, in the world of financial exploitation of older adults, uh, we are going through a pandemic or I call it an epidemic. Um, everybody no doubt is aware of the COVID-19 pandemic. But the reality is that exploitation of older adults is on fire. And uh, it is an extraordinarily serious problem. Uh, I've uh, had numerous discussions now with the uh, ex excellent director, uh, Paula Basta of the Illinois Department of Aging. And uh, I think everybody is aware of this problem and we're all collectively uh, putting our shoulders to the grindstone to see what uh, new and creative solutions we can come up with to cease, halt, and reduce financial exploitation. In large measure, though, it's public education. Uh, we need to teach our seniors not to fall prey to financial exploitation. In many instances, they, hit, they uh, have no choice, certainly if it's an electronic scam or an internet scam. Uh, they may be unaware of it, but in many instances, uh, older adults uh, participate unwittingly uh, in financial exploitation. And we need to continue to educate our community to make sure that they understand these problems. Uh, Lauren, so you can see the, uh, the slide up there. 
it's not anybody you want to meet uh, in a dark place or even in the daytime. Uh, dishonest people uh, in any form of cognitive impairment, whether that's a result of Alzheimer's disease, a stroke, Parkinson's, any form of cognitive impairment, dishonest people, regrettably uh, equals and leads to financial exploitation. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we put together a, uh, a series of uh, statistics that we've uh, updated quite recently. And um, it's a little bit hard to see, I think, on the Zoom screen, but uh, financial exploitation most often is committed by family members, 54%, and uh, caregivers or care workers, about a third. So those are rather startling statistics, I would suggest. Uh, loving children often steal money from their parents, their grandparents, things of that nature. And the caregivers uh, have become, I think, not just a thorn in our side, but uh, a leader uh, in the world of older adult exploitation. We see them in a lot of different formats. We see them particularly with uh, younger women uh, exploiting older men that they uh, take care of 24 seven. And um, again, that continues to be a problem. Here in Illinois, we passed a caregiver statute. Uh, if a caregiver receives $20,000 in a testamentary transaction, meaning post-death, or joint tenancy or something of that nature upon the demise of an individual. <laughs> if that gift is in excess of $20,000 here in Illinois, it is presumed to be fraudulent. And that caregiver will be required to overcome a very steep curve to demonstrate that it is not fraudulent. So, that's been a, a pretty uh, good addition to the tools to combat older adult uh, exploitation, but regrettably it's after an individual is deceased. So uh, that's, a, that's a new innovation. Uh, the rates of elder abuse have increased as a result of the COVID pandemic, uh, potentially by as much as 84%. The stats I'm talking about now come to us from the National Center on Elder Abuse and the World Health Organization. Uh, and again, we've, we've tried to pull together uh, the current available statistics, uh, but some of the stats and studies are old. A 2017 study shows that data about abuse is really scarce. Uh, only about 7% of older adults self-report their uh, exploitation in a community setting, where about almost 14% of older adults in an institutional setting report exploitation on their own or through a proxy, probably their power of attorney, maybe their child. <laughs> so self-reporting is really, really low. And of course, the, the answer is for those that aren't yet in a nursing home, uh, they don't wanna tell their kids they were abused. They don't want to tell their family they were abused because the response is you can't take care of your assets. You can't take care of yourself into a nursing home. You go. Um, on my right uh, side of the screen, perhaps your left, and I'm not sure whether it's blocked by the uh, the Zoom pictures of, of uh, the people attending or the hosts. Um, Lauren, can you tell me, can people see that, that uh, graph? Yes. Yes, everyone should be able to. Good, okay. Thanks, Carol. Uh, thanks, Lauren. So um, out of the fiscal year 2020 uh, report that the state of Illinois Department of Aging produces pursuant to its uh, responsibilities, you can see that uh, by a long shot, financial exploitation is the highest uh, reported abuse. And that's well over the 6,000 uh, 
it certainly looks like financial abuse is accompanied by emotional abuse because we've got just over 4,000 emotionally uh, abuse cases reported. And then it kind of tapers off uh, in a different direction. Self-neglect, passive neglect, physical abuse, uh, willful deprivation. That's where somebody withholds often food, medication, uh, things like that. Uh, we've been involved in my law firm in many, many, many cases in which people are uh, kidnapped, so to speak, put into um, uh, their child's home, their granddaughter's home, townhouse, apartment, and until they sign a new estate plan uh, with food is withheld, water is withheld, uh, visits with the grandchildren, medication withheld. Uh, so that's a willful deprivation. Um, Mickey Rooney, famous uh, actor, Mickey Rooney testified before the United States Senate Committee, uh, Select Committee on Aging, that his stepson willfully deprived him of food and water, uh, as well as access to uh, his financial records uh, in order to financially exploit him. So uh, it can happen to just about anybody and uh, we see it on a pretty regular basis. I think willful deprivation goes hand in hand with confinement, uh, which again is typically, uh, I'm gonna keep you here in this house uh, until you sign a new estate plan. That's typically the way it goes. Or you add me uh, as uh, a joint tenant to your account, uh, something of that nature. So, uh, and finally, um, Sexual abuse, which uh, the numbers uh, are seem relatively low, but I think one case of sexual abuse is too many. Uh, and I suspect that in reality, this number is far higher, but people are completely humiliated, embarrassed, and uh, don't wish to report any form of sexual abuse to anyone, let alone the state of Illinois. Carrie, I have a question. Um, All right. You mentioned uh, a few moments ago that any caregiver that gets $20,000 or remains with $20,000 that, that now that there's a new statute that's looked into. Mm -hmm. uh, is that including if it was already in a will or depending on when it, you know, in their documents or is that just totally at all? No, it's at all. If the, if the individual dies post, uh, post enactment of the statute, you know, uh, that doesn't matter when the will was done. Interesting. I wasn't aware of that. When did that go into effect? Recently or has it About been? About a year and a half ago, roughly. Oh. Yes, thank you. Fairly recent. And it really was a pushback by the uh, elder law lawyer community to, uh, to try and come up with a method to you know, reduce these caregiver exploitation cases. Right. And are we talking about in that case, a caregiver as we know it through an agency or independent caregiver, or are we talking about children as caregivers? It, it's, we're in general talking about independent caregivers. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, it's possible that, you know, the children may go at it. Uh, if one child doesn't want somebody to get the money, they right. may try and categorize them as a caregiver. But sure. in large measure, this is, uh, it, it, the intention was non-blood. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so moving ahead to the hypothetical, uh, you can see the, uh, the photograph of, of a uh, couple up there. Charlie and his wife, Patty, had been married for 40 years at the time Patty died a year ago. Uh, Charlie was CEO of a large company. He received a generous compensation package at the time of his retirement. Two months before uh, his long-term wife, Patty, died, Charlie suffered a stroke and he was hospitalized. Charlie's mental capacity was affected by his stroke as well as his ability to walk more than a very short distance. 
Charlie immediately enrolled in a stroke rehab program at the local hospital. Uh, many physicians like Charlie's recommended it. After uh, Patty's death, Charlie continued to live in their Chicago condo on his own while handling all of his personal and financial affairs. Charlie had no children and he had one sister, Sally, but she'd never been involved with his financial affairs. She lived in California. She was aware, however, that she was named successor agent after his now deceased wife, Patty, under health care and property powers of attorney that Charlie had signed five years earlier when he updated his estate plan. When Charlie began uh, his rehabilitation program at the uh, hospital, at the direction of his doctor, a young, attractive personal trainer, Amber, was assigned to assist him. Amber had six-pack abs and a seven-year-old daughter. After Patty's death, Amber took a special interest in Charlie. One day after rehab, Amber asked Charlie to help her replace a light bulb at her nearby apartment. From then on, Charlie's handyman skills resulted in frequent visits to Amber's home after their rehab sessions. Shortly thereafter, Amber asked Charlie to co-sign a car loan so she could get a new Audi SUV. Charlie readily agreed. Eventually, Amber and her daughter stayed at Charlie's condo more than at their own apartment. Five months later, Amber suggested Charlie execute durable powers of attorney naming her as agent. Since Patty's no longer able to help, she died. And she, Amber, was right in Chicago and not far away like his sister. Charlie agreed and was immediately swept away by Amber to a nearby attorney who had previously been contacted by Amber. He'd already drawn up the powers of attorney for healthcare and property based upon the information that Amber provided over the phone. During the brief office visit, the attorney asked if Charlie wanted to appoint Amber, his decision maker and agent for health care and property. Charlie responded, yes. The next day, Amber changed the beneficiary on three of Charlie's life insurance policies from his sister, Sally, to herself. In the next several months, Amber withdrew large sums of money from Charlie's bank account she bought uh, a lakefront home in Michigan for $450,000. $20,000 of her assets were used to purchase savings bonds for her daughter. $75,000 of his assets were used to pay off her car loan that he co-signed. Later in the week, Sally got a call that Charlie was in the hospital. Remember, Sally's the sister who lives in California. She immediately flew to Chicago to visit him. At first, the hospital staff refused to discuss his situation because Amber was his power of attorney. Sally produced a copy of the power of attorney created five years earlier so that the hospital would share information with him. Still, the hospital considered Amber to be the agent with authority to make healthcare decisions since her power of attorney had been signed more recently. Charlie's sister arranges a consultation with an attorney to discuss her concerns about Charlie and what can be done to protect him from financial exploitation. So I think maybe before we move on, uh, we ought to engage as best we can in an uh, interactive discussion about Charlie and Amber and uh, Sally. Um, you know, we call these cases um, both financial exploitation cases as well as dueling powers of attorney. And uh, of course, the reality here is that uh, if properly executed and Charlie was competent, Amber's powers of attorney will take precedence over his sister's. Why? Because again, he needs to be mentally competent. 
uh, and they're signed more currently than the older ones. It's possible uh, that one could allege that Amber unduly influenced Charlie to sign these powers of attorney. So uh, if I got involved in this kind of situation, there's little doubt that we would contend that the powers of attorney that Amber has were the result of undue influence by Amber. Uh, the documents were prepared by an attorney that Charlie didn't hire. Amber hired the attorney and Amber took him to the uh, law firm we don't intentionally have factually uh, information regarding who paid the bill, but there's little doubt Amber hired the lawyer because Charlie never had a conversation with the drafting lawyer in advance. Uh, an attack on these powers of attorney would likely occur in the probate court uh, in which uh, Sally, sister, would likely seek to have Charlie adjudicated disabled and have herself appointed Charlie's guardian of the person, management of healthcare, and of the estate, management of financial affairs, in order to protect him from Amber. Mm. So, questions? No. Okay. All right, Laura, let's move on. Thank you. So under a recently enacted federal law, uh, there is an okay way uh, to protect yourself from financial exploitation. And that is that you can name when you open bank accounts and particularly trust, excuse me, brokerage accounts, you can name a trusted content. So uh, you want to name someone that you trust regarding your money. Okay. And the purpose here is that when you're not competent to make decisions, should you have a stroke, should you uh, be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, some type of cognitive impairment that's going to affect your competency, the institution where you have your money or your portfolio has approval to speak with your trusted contact. And now this is a big deal because as you know, banks and brokers won't talk to anybody but their client slash customer directly. This gives them complete cover and authority to speak with your trusted contact that you pick while you're mentally competent to tell them, I want Carol on my account. Should you not be able to reach me? Should you be concerned that someone is financially exploiting me? You are directly authorized to contact Carol and discuss my account and the concerns you have regarding my potential financial exploitation. So this is revolutionary because it allows these people, as I mentioned moments ago, to talk to someone other than their direct client or customer. Very, very important change in the law at the federal level. So what is a trusted contact? Uh, a trusted contact is a person you can rely on and as I mentioned, when you open your bank account or your brokerage account, you name your trusted contact. Nobody else is picking that person for you. Uh, and this allows you to have someone to uh, try and protect you from financial exploitation. We recommend you choose someone other than the joint tenant on your account. Joint tenancy, of course, is generally husband and wife own an asset in joint tenancy could be a stock brokerage account, could be a house. When husband dies first, wife gets the asset. We recommend you name someone other than your joint tenant so that there's a potential third party and a new set of eyes that can be uh, not subject to the financial exploitation 
than often husband and wives are. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about some financial exploitation cases. Stan Lee, who uh, was the co-creator of Spider-Man and Iron Man and the Hulk and many, many more, died in late 2018. And uh, his life really, you know, kind of went downhill quite quickly when his wife died the year before. Lee's manager, uh, Kia Morgan, forced Lee to record videos that were later published online speaking highly of his relationship with Morgan in an attempt to undercut, shoot down claims that Morgan uh, had in some manner financially exploited Stan, Stan Lee. Uh, a 2018 restraining order later said Morgan prevented Lee from seeing his family, his friends, tried to control his money and his business. And in 2019, Morgan was charged with felony uh, theft, embezzlement, forgery, and fraud against an older adult, uh, and false imprisonment charges. A misdemeanor count alleged elder abuse. So it's pretty clear that Stanley knew what was going on here uh, and in some fashion reached out, got some help. But his abuser was close. Ian Morgan was his manager and uh, abused him very substantially. Next slide. So in Chicago, Mr. Cobb, Ernie Banks, uh, there's some controversy whether Ernie was financially exploited, but the reality is uh, three months prior to his death, there was a new estate plan done. Uh, the caregiver prevented him from children from seeing him. And of course, the issue for, for Mr. Cobb who received from uh, President Obama the uh, National Congressional Medal of Honor was when did Ernie become demented? How significant was it when his documents were done? Who knew? Who took advantage of that situation? And so forth. So regrettably in this scenario, as we see in many financial exploitation scenarios, new estate planning documents were done for Ernie Banks within approximately three months uh, of his passing. And uh, those documents were dramatically different than documents, I leave my assets to my children. Next slide. I mentioned Mickey Rooney uh, in the context of both confinement and willful deprivation. Uh, and I said his stepson took control of his finances forced him to do performances that he didn't wish to do, and then took the money as well. Uh, so Mickey Rooney had about over $400,000 taken from him. He and his wife had uh, food and water withheld from them. Uh, and I think it's notable, Mickey Rooney's quote said, I was eventually completely stripped of the ability to make even the most basic decisions in my own life. If elder abuse can happen to me, Mickey Rooney, it can happen to anybody. And I think that's really true. Mickey Rooney was way up there, high profile guy, uh, active in the community. And all of a sudden he's subject to elder abuse, and financial abuse. And, uh, and, you know, he's got a circumstance that, at best could be described as horrific with his steps. You gotta give Mickey Rooney a lot of credit for publicly reporting his uh, situation. So what are the warning signs of financial exploitation? Uh, well, <laughs> many of them kind of jump off the page. A stranger offers investment advice, a deal that's too good to be true, a dream opportunity, uh, a claim that the older person has won the prize uh, or lottery money, but has to pay taxes or fees. This is, a, you know, the Nigerian lottery. The, the, it comes in a lot of different forms 
of names primarily, but it's all the same. It's you won uh, either a lottery uh, via a ticket or some type of uh, monetary benefit. Send us $5,000 to cover the costs and the taxes, and we'll send you or deliver you the million dollars or what, however uh, extravagant the number is. Of course, it's all a scam to get the money uh, to either pay the taxes or pay the administrative fees. And you never hear from those people ever again. So this is a, a real buyer beware, older adult beware scam. Next slide, please. Additional warning signs. A stranger's quickly become a close friend. Some strangers eager to please the older uh, person. Friendship becomes uh, very quickly uh, ensues. Uh, in many instances, I call these cases love at first sight of his wallet. Uh, a lot of younger women are uh, on the path here to a very quick, very sudden marriage with a wealthy older guy who may be uh, on his deathbed, maybe demented, uh, maybe totally incapable of marrying, let alone taking care of himself. And um, we see these May, December bride scenarios uh, a lot. I was involved in a case in which the caregiver drove uh, the older gentleman from county to county in Florida. The first two counties refused to marry them because he was so demented. The third county married him. So that's a big problem. Uh, likewise, additional warning signs for elder abuse, requests for personal information, social security check information, banking, stock certificates, IDs, social security numbers, as I mentioned, uh, anything in which somebody's asking you to provide them with identity theft type information, end the conversation, hang up the phone, walk away. Do not give people personal identity theft information. And the bullet points on the screen fit the bill perfectly. Next slide, please. Be careful whose uh, loan you guarantee. Be careful whose loan you co-sign. Don't provide collateral for someone else's loan. Exceptions, of course, might be for your wife, your husband, and maybe a child. Um, don't sign documents you don't understand. If you're asked to sign a power of attorney for property, don't sign it unless you with a lawyer that you trust and the document is what you understand. You've read it, the lawyers explained it, you've chosen your agent to make decisions for you. Uh, deeds, similarly, reverse mortgages, change trustee of a trust, change of beneficiaries in a will, a trust, an IRA, uh, make the changes on your 401ks or your life insurance. Very, very important. Many of those documents require one signature, no notary, okay? So there's no additional protection. Very important. You understand what you're being asked to sign. So what are your other tips to stay safe? Well, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it over and over. Protect your financial information. Protect your social security number. Protect your Medicare number. Protect your date of birth. Protect your address. All of those last couple, people can generally get it online. But why make it easier for someone to abuse you if they can't uh, do it without that information? So. 
If you get a phone call, hi, ring, 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 this is the IRS, where's your money? You know? Or this is the Social Security Administration. Uh, we've heard that uh, you're not using your money properly. We're going to cut it off. Uh, crazy stuff that you hear on the, on the telephone uh, that we, we have now what's called the grandparent scam. Grandmother gets a call in the middle of the night. It's Johnny. It's 4 a.m. I'm in jail. Send me $5,000 by Western Union and I'll get out. Grandma trots on down to the Western Union. We've been involved in cases like this. The Western Union man says, Grandma, this is a fraud. Don't do it. Grandma says, they have my son in jail. I need to send him the money. And of course, it's a complete scam. So don't be intimidated by pushy marketing calls. When you uh, order online, read the fine print, whether it's online or telev television. Uh, consult someone if you're not sure. You know? Hey, I'm not so sure this is on the up and up. Can you help me decide? Okay, I'll help you decide. Uh, but if it sounds good, too good to be true, it is. We already know that. It is. Don't get involved in something that promises 100% return on your money before you've invested any money. Ridiculous. Next slide, please. We talked about that. So typical uh, scenarios in terms of uh, elder abuse, uh, take a look at the picture on, the, on the, uh, my right, the uh, Howard Marshall and Anna Nicole Smith wedding. I think the difference in age here was roughly 40 plus years. Uh, and this really is a Anna Nicole Smith uh, love at first sight of Howard Marshall's wallet. Howard Marshall was very, very, very wealthy. And you can see on their wedding day how happy they both are. Didn't last long, but that's the way it goes. So common scenarios include a breach of fiduciary duty. What does that mean? An agent under a power of attorney uses your money or takes money from you and puts it in their account. Uh, there are other fiduciary relationships as well. Undue influence, go all the way back to our discussion about uh, the will that we talked about in, during this presentation. Did someone unduly influence uh, the individuals called the testator to sign the will, the set lord who signed the trust, is, uh, are they susceptible to undue influence? Are they cognitively impaired? Were they unduly influenced by a child of, uh, you know, your, your children? Did the grandparent come by and say, Grandma, so good to see you, leave me money, I want money. Well, you know, grandparents, I think, hear that all the time, but probably not to leave me money. Caregiver exploitation, we've talked about. It's definitely, definitely on the upswing and with us today. Uh, lack of mental capacity, fraudulent deeds, drafting and executing a new estate plan and conversion. They're all kind of related. Uh, in order to do an estate plan in Illinois, we need to have testamentary capacity. And that's evidenced by the ability to one, understand you're doing a will, okay? Two, you need to know the natural objects of your bounty. In English, that means you need to know who your family is. Three, you need to know the nature and extent of your assets. Do you own something other than the book that uh, is available in conjunction with these proceedings or these, this lecture? Um, do you have the capacity to form a plan in your mind to create a will? Or 
Are you so cognitively impaired that you can't do it? Fraudulent deeds are a problem. Again, nominal signatures. And we talked about drafting and executing new estate plans. And the last but not least, the conversion of money and property. If someone takes your money and your, your property, uh, there may be a remedy, a legal remedy to file what we call a, con a uh, citation to recover those assets or a citation to discover and determine where those assets are, how much of those assets were taken. Uh, so these are common scenarios often involving the agent under a power of attorney taking advantage of the principal, stealing their money. So what are the uh, remedies? Some in the courtroom, some not, but mostly in the courtroom. Uh, if an individual is cognitively impaired and, and, and many times we can't tell without a, a medical evaluation, uh, we get a medical evaluation. And if an individual has been financially exploited, in many cases, we go in and ask the court to appoint on an emergency basis a temporary guardian. And uh, pre-COVID, it took two to three days. During the COVID era, it could take uh, as much as a week. But these are proceedings that occur very quickly based on medical evidence. Does Carol have the capacity to make her own decisions? If so, great. If not, I need a medical report to file for guardianship. So what are the other remedies? Make sure that if you're competent, you have power of attorney documents. In Illinois, they come in two forms, power of attorney for healthcare, power of attorney for property, which is generic for assets. Power of attorney is a legal document granting authority to another whom you trust to act for you in certain circumstances, almost like your legal clone, like the Doubleman twins, up on the screen. There are two types of powers of attorney, as I mentioned in Illinois, one for healthcare, one for property. Uh, and uh, you can choose different agents if you wish for each role. You might have a child who's a nurse and you might, might want that child to make medical decisions when you're not competent. Might have a child who's a CPA you want that certified public accountant to manage your assets when you're no longer capable. So that's a very uh, quick, uh, brief overview of what remedies are available. Next slide, please. So additional remedies might include the preparation of a revocable living trust in which I create a trust. I put all my assets in the trust I name myself trustee. I name a successor trustee to take over when I'm no longer capable of managing my affairs. I assign specific assets to the trust and estate document. I note that a revocable living trust can be amended in the future. That's why it says revocable versus irrevocable. You're gonna, yes, assign an irrevocable trust please make sure you understand exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. So revocable trusts can be amended at any time. Uh, they, can, they avoid the necessity of guardianship and they often avoid the necessity of our law clerks going to the courthouse uh, to get specific uh, documents. Next slide, please. So guardians, uh, like agents under power of attorney come in two forms. A guardian is a court appointed individual. A guardian is a person who makes medical decisions, not the management of property, not the management of your bank accounts, not the management of any assets. A guardian is a person's role is medical and placement, okay? Does Carol need to be in the hospital when she's released? What facility will she go to? And of course, Elder Works uh, has a division that deals with placement. 
of older adults. So guardian of the person is medical, guardian of the estate makes financial decisions. This is where you may have a meeting as has been proposed earlier uh, with third parties regarding, hey, can you give a speech at another bank? Hey, can you give a speech to a, a, a variety of folks uh, other than the bankers? So guardian of the estate is a court approved, court appointed guardian. I'll go all the way back to our hypothetical with Charlie and Patty and uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that Sally wants to be appointed Charlie's guardian to make decisions for him. And even if he is ultimately adjudicated, uh, it's important to know that there is a guardian of the estate and there is a guardian of the person. Very distinct roles. Uh, in Illinois, one person can act as both. So that's important to understand as well. Next slide, please. So when you select a lawyer, I would encourage you to select a lawyer that's experienced uh, in elder law, whether it's for guardianship, whether it's for estate planning. You can find out if your lawyer is a member of NALA, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. You can find out if they've written anything in uh, recent times in a, a, a journal you might be interested in. Uh, you might want to consider making sure that an elder law attorney is a member of the National <coughs> Attorney, uh, excuse me, National Elder National Association of Elder Law Attorneys. Uh, I was president of the uh, NALA Group, National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys here in Illinois, and I served on the national board for uh, a period of time as well. So you also want to find out what does your lawyer uh, have by way of experience in the community? Have they spoken out against uh, financial exploitation? Uh, are they active in, in engaging in potentially uh, decisions that are going to help or hurt the principal in the principal agency relationship? <clears throat> agency is I'm principal and I named Carol as my agent. She can only act within the parameters of the powers that I've given her, but for she can, uh, you know, become an advocate for protecting the elderly and disabled in the uh, afternoon, so to speak, of uh, today. So I think we've covered it. Are there other questions about financial exploitation? None. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? You can certainly unmute yourselves or put it in the chat and I'll unmute you either way. I don't see others. I had a example, Carrie, that um, you've certainly covered so much information here, which has been excellent. Uh, I have a client myself who's had uh, many stroke and uh, had lost her insurance and is determining if she can stay home. A little bit difficult to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so nonetheless, I was helping her with something and she said, well, tell me about my bank statement. And she went into her bank account and then she went into her email. And she had literally thousands of emails. And I started, said, well, scroll down on these. And she has been, um, she has quite a good income. And so she has been donating to one of the political organizations. And according to her, she's only donating on a one-time basis. Well, whatever you donate, uh, she does $100 at a time they add on another 10% to, in her mind, keep the organization running. There were some that were repeated, which I could see on her banking information. And I said, you know, you really should not 
be doing this. I said, better you would just send one check when they're running. And these were people that weren't even in the state of Illinois. Um, I looked at that sort of as, again, financial exploitation or preying on people that really can't make proper decisions. I'm not sure there's a remedy for it other than to block that email, but she had 15,000 emails on her email. Wow. Yeah, so it's it was quite eye-opening to say the least. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yes, I couldn't believe it. And um, I thought this is so concerning, but you know, sometimes you have to do step-by-step step to get some of this stuff rectified because um, she's still able to make decisions and she's afraid if she can't do what she wants to do that she's losing her ability to make her own decisions. So it's a difficult situation, but another example of exploiting people in my opinion. I agree. It definitely is. The, uh, there's been a lot of press that uh, in various fine, small print on many uh, candidate and campaign donations made online that uh, the older adults or, you know, anybody is not aware that it's a multi-year or multi-month or long-term commitment to donate money rather than one time. Right. So it's really, really important that everybody read all the quote unquote fine print before making campaign or uh, donations uh, of that nature. I think another issue that I've come across is the issue of magazine subscriptions um, or publishers clearinghouse type subscriptions. And I experienced that when my husband had dementia and uh, came home one day and here was this renewal for something. And I said, what is this? Oh, I've only signed up for one year. Well, I called and found out he had signed up for 10 years and <laughs> we were continuing, I got it taken care of. But you know, if somebody's not watching, um, it's a problem, so. Yeah, no, I agree, it's a problem, I mean, it it occurs in, in uh, political scenarios, and in, as you point out, in magazine subscriptions. And of course, part of the dilemma is that when you're trying to read a computer screen and the, and the uh, size of the font is small to begin with, Absolutely. these fonts are almost invisible. Right. Uh, we do have another question. Um, if there are institutions who can take fiduciary responsibility if you don't have family or friends that can handle it? Uh, there are uh, organizations that do it. I think in general, there's some not-for-profit organizations that do it, guardianship agencies. Some banks will act as power of attorney agents under a power of attorney for property, depending mm -hmm. on how much you have in the way of assets in that institution. Um, but in general, uh, it, it's it's a bit of a problem and there's a slight gap in that regard. Yes, I would agree. Um, and a little bit more about, um, somebody's asked a little bit more about contractors. Um, let me unmute that. Amanda, can you explain what you mean by that? Or can you unmute and come on? Uh, we're having difficulty. You're not coming. We've got problems. We're having technical problems here. Yes. Type in there. Is the question in the chat, Carol? Uh, yes, it says, can you talk a little bit more about contractors? But I'm not sure what she's asking on that. Um, well, I'm going to just uh, perhaps launch out in here contractors. 
Um, you know, contractors are, are notoriously, some contractors, uh, scam older adults, the roofers, uh, regrettably are well known for that. Uh, right. They'll go up on the roof, they'll tear off a shingle, uh, they'll knock on the door, ring the bell and say, we were in the neighborhood and we saw your roof was having trouble uh, and we're prepared to probably go up right now and uh, fix your roof. Uh, so those are pretty unscrupulous contractors. If you don't know somebody or meaning if you didn't call them to the premises, don't do business with them. Um, you know, there are some contractor scenarios where one contractor's at the front door uh, distract, distracting an older adult and the other contractor uh, surreptitiously enters the home through the back, heads up to the bedroom, steals the jewelry and any cash and is out before the older adult realizes it. So uh, it's possible that those scenarios are still continuing. Oh, it happens all the time. And um, personally, I live in a 55 plus community and uh, that is rampant here. And whenever we have like, you know, there's warnings about storms coming and you're gonna have all this wind and so forth and so on. And there's been a few times that uh, there's been uh, trees that have gone down and that type of thing. And sure enough, uh, the contractors, as soon as that storm lets up, are sitting outside on the street and knocking on doors. Yeah. So it and happens. It's, it's ongoing. totally unscrupulous, and um, they're not the slightest bit interested in a small hit. They want to hit big and, and go. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, do we, if we have other questions, uh, I think that we possibly do not. Um, Carrie, just uh, in closing, and we certainly thank you for all of your time and information. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, side as the author and uh, the books that you've written? So sure, we'll... of course. Um, I was asked by uh, the American Bar Association to write two books. Uh, this one uh, is called Don't Let Dementia Steal Everything. This is written for the community, uh, for non-lawyers. And the other book uh, that I was asked to write uh, is Alzheimer's and the Law. And uh, that is written for judges and lawyers. Both of those books uh, are available through the American Bar Association website or through Amazon. Uh, the book is written for the community uh, we, we worked very hard to make sure it was very affordable. I think it sells for about $21, $22 roughly uh, on Amazon. It's a checklist book. So you're not going to read this book from cover to cover. It's not a legal thriller. Although Scott Tarot, the author of legal thrillers, uh, which some turned into movies, wrote the foreword for these books uh, and talks about his mother's uh, experience and journey with Alzheimer's. So uh, this is, as I said, is a checklist book. You can open it up, look at the table of contents, find a particular issue that, that is of interest to you and read that and move on. So um, we at Peck Ritchie have offices, as you can see in Chicago in the financial district in Northbrook and in Oakbrook. Uh, we offer our, our potential clients the opportunity to meet with us uh, by Zoom, by phone, some in person. Uh, and determine if we can help you, uh, find out if there's chemistry between us and you. And um, we do that at no, no cost uh, for the initial consultation. We put all our fee agreements in writing so there's no confusion. And we look forward to uh, working with you and your family and your potential referrals uh, in any way possible. Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Appreciate your time and your knowledge as also and your continued partnership with ElderWorks. And we're also here to help anytime. Uh, do thank you. And uh, Lauren, thank you very much. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. You too.